Hello, hello. How's everyone doing today? Uh, my name is Tane. I'm an engineer on the Blazor team. And thank you so much for joining us today uh, for a very special October part two community stand-up. Uh, today, we're going to be speaking with Matthew about Skiersharp. Uh, Matthew, do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah. Uh, hi, thanks for having me on the show. Uh, I'm a software engineer at Microsoft. I work on the, the Maui team. And uh, before uh, before that, I was prim primarily focused on Skier Sharp, and I like to do pretty much all things that uh, help developers be more productive. Maybe creating tools, libraries, and stuff like that. So That's I hope awesome. I've been helping people. Yeah, for sure. Thank you so much for joining us. And we also have uh, the co-host John. John, do you want to introduce yourself? I think we may have actually lost John there. Unless he's got a very intensive scene. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. Uh, I'm sure he'll be with us again shortly. But in the meantime, let's start off with some community links. Now, these community links are just a bunch of links from uh, the community of cool projects, articles, and blog posts that people have done. So I wanted to show uh, some of those off today. So hopefully, you should be able to see the screen there. So let's start off with the first link. Uh, this is a blog post about pre-rendering for Blazor Web Summary on static web hosting. So um, let's break this down a bit. Uh, first of all, what's static web hosting? Static web hosting is when you're serving the files directly instead of having a server directly uh, execute code and all that kind of stuff. So this is something like running it off of Azure Storage or Cloudflare Pages or something like that directly instead of something like Blazor Server, which requires an active signal or connection uh, with the server. So uh, the reason why that can become problematic sometimes is uh, something like Blazor WebAssembly. It actually needs to uh, uh, run some DLLs and go through some processing and stuff like that uh, to uh, render fully. Now, this can be problematic for something like uh, SEO, search engine optimization. So when something like the Bing bot or Google bot or something like that is scanning the page, it needs to understand what the page content is. And if we don't pre-render it, then it may just get, say, a loading bar or something like that. So it's important to uh, consider these uh, sort of uh, cases when you want to build applications which uh, perform search engine optimization and all that kind of stuff. So uh, what this article is about is a new package that this person has created uh, called Blazor Wasm Pre-Rendering, uh, which during build time actually uh, pre-renders the application so that uh, it can be published and it becomes more searchable and all that kind of stuff. So if this is something that you're interested in doing, please do check it out. Moving on, uh, the second article I wanted to share today is with regards to custom deployment layouts for Blazor WebAssembly applications. Now, what these are is essentially in certain environments, for example, corporate environments and stuff like that, uh, you may be restricted by firewalls in the downloading and execution of DLLs in the network. This is more so a security measure uh, to prevent malware, viruses, and all that kind of stuff. So uh, what this does is it provides a NuGet package, uh, which has JavaScript initializers and so on, which allow more configurability and control over the, how the packages are downloaded and so on. So uh, this should help alleviate some of the concerns some users have been seeing with regards to corporate firewalls and that kind of stuff to actually get the Blazor uh, web some applications up and running appropriately within their environments. So if you're uh, facing some of those constraints, definitely check out this article. Um, OK, cool. Uh, let's move on to the next one. Uh, this uh, article, or this series of articles, really, in the docs, uh, Microsoft Docs site, is uh, Introduction to .NET MAUI. .NET MAUI stands for a .NET Multi-Platform App UI, and it's essentially a cross-platform framework for providing native uh, mobile and desktop applications um, using C-Sharp and XAML. I don't want to go too much into it because um, I think Matthew may be, <laughs> uh, may be a great person to speak more about it, given that he's been on the .NET MAUI team. Matthew, do you want to just say uh, some words for it? Yeah, uh, sure. Uh, so .NET MAUI is, is sort of like a next evolution is what everyone calls it. But it's like taking Xamarin Forms and say, what can we learn from the past, I don't know, 10 plus years, as long as it's been around, and say, how can we do better using, uh, first of all, .NET 6 and all the new things with .NET, but also with all the new things with the platform. So it's, it's really 
um, it's the, the core of, of Xamarin forms that you know and use today, but just uh, redone like, okay, how can we do the innards better, you know, renderers and how can we get rid of them and make it more like, okay, I want to overwrite this one method. How do I do that better? So that, that's really the goal is just to make your life easier when you're using Xamarin forms. And obviously it's very nice to be part of the .NET. We're working closer with the .NET runtime team and the SDK team and the IDE teams, even closer than before. So um, we took the opportunity to come up with a new name and come up with new ideas to, to help make your apps faster, better, and smoother. That's awesome. And yeah, uh, this is a great uh, application. Uh, this is a great framework. And uh, should you want to learn more about it, definitely check out the series of articles. It's still under production or under construction, uh, but um, it should give you a great brief overview of what it is and uh, let you kind of decide if this may be something you want to learn more about or explore more and try out in your application set. Yeah, you can try it right, right in VS. No, just check the box in VS and you can get started right away as well. So. Yep. Uh, is it uh, for VS 2022 or 2019 as well? Uh, right now it's 2022 in the previews. Okay, cool. So, so cool. So just for people who may be wondering. Um, cool. So the last thing here is, again, I wanted to highlight that we have .NET Conf coming up. This is uh, an event from November 9th to 11th, and this is where we're going to be uh, unveiling .NET 6 and a bunch of great functionality and so on uh, during the conference. So definitely, if you want to learn more about .NET 6, some of the great, great speakers that we have presenting, and a bunch of other stuff, definitely make sure to uh, register and sign up and enjoy the event. Uh, cool. So that basically wraps up uh, the community link section. I see that we have John back. Yeah. Uh, one John? thing while you're on this page, uh, if you scroll up to the top on the .NET Conf thing, we also have a bunch of local events. Um, so if you click on local events, there are local events all over the world. These go through January. Um, these are done. Um, we had some really good ones last year, like they're, uh, you know, done in different languages. We had a whole stream of them going through um, like Asia. We had a, a team that put on several large events through South America. And these are all, there's a, um, a team that helps run this, like a, a volunteer team uh, around the world that helps like set up live streaming and everything. So these are awesome and you can host one yourself. So, so this is pretty cool too. You can, um, there's a thing there, you can community event request form and you can set it up, so. Anyway, I just want to make sure people know about that. Yeah, this is cool too. So what we do is during the event, we um, we get the slides, we get the code demos, we get the keynote code and all that stuff, and we make it available so that people can use it at their own local events. So, yeah. That's awesome. I didn't even know uh, this was around. This is a great feature and uh, it, it's great for people. Uh, this can serve as a great networking opportunity as well, just to speak to people in their area, see what's happening in their local communities and so on. So this is awesome. Mm -hmm. And if you, if you look on that list, there's the event type and it shows like there's some that are in person, there's some that are in person and live streamed, there's some that are virtual only. Um, and so it's just, but they're, you know, they're run by local speakers. So it gives an opportunity for local speakers and different, you know, you can get uh, different opinions, you know, you can get people showing how they are using things or what they, they, um, their experience with .NET 6 and the new things. So yeah, it's, it's, it's a amazing and it's all put on by community. You know, we help support it, but it's, it's all local meetups and stuff. So. Cool. Yeah. Yep. This is awesome. Um, okay. So that basically wraps up the community link section. Uh, John, we lost you there for a second, but do you yeah. want to introduce yourself? Yeah, hi, I'm John. I am uh, I am the one person who forgot my lucky reboot that I do every Tuesday morning right before stand up, and I didn't do it today and see what happened. Um, <laughs> I'm a PM on the .NET community team, and uh, yeah, just happy to be here. <laughs> Thank you. Um, okay, awesome. So um, let's move on directly to Matthew. Uh, Matthew is going to be showing us Skiershop today, as well as how Skiershop can integrate with Blazor with native bindings. So, Matthew, do you want to? Let me just share your screen. Okay, and you're muted, by the way. <laughs> it wouldn't be a community stand up without having to say those <laughs> words. <laughs> muted myself so I wouldn't like breathing on the call while everyone else was talking. and. Whatever. All right. All right. Hello, everyone. Thanks for, for joining. I hope I can um, 
share some exciting things uh, about about. I, I wanted to say like, okay, looking at Skier Sharp doing native stuff is cool, but I thought you know what, you as developers as well as you know, you might be interested in knowing how it was done, but also like you might have a library that you want to integrate with Blazor, whether it be a C++. I'm also going to show off some JavaScript uh, native interop. But I thought, you know, uh, I've heard talk amongst people on the on the Twitter and out there about like, oh, how would I integrate this random C++ library that I love uh, or the C engine that I love? So that's totally possible. Skiersharp is primarily was originally a desktop framework and now it's on the web. Whoa. So, uh, so yeah. So let me open the correct window. No, nope, not that one. That's that's for that's for later. Okay. So, um, whoops. Why is it not going next? There we go. So give those moments for the machine to wake up. Um, so I, I thought I'll cover quickly first on JavaScript native because if you think about a browser, JavaScript is the native language of the the browser, but also some native in the sense of machine code that you compiled with, you know. With a, with a compiler, so that would be C, C++, and I'll show you how you can use both sort of in your app today, side by side, and that's how a skier shop is built on, right? We've got to integrate with JavaScript and the HTML side of it by registering like the refresh events for a canvas, right? We've got to wait for the browser to say, hey, it's time to refresh. We trigger that, but also we want to integrate with the native part with uh, C++, you know, using pinvoke and all the, the weird shenanigans there. So let's start off with some JavaScript. So uh, hopefully there'll be time for a little bit of a demo afterwards, but let's let's look at some code on slides, nice and clean, and it allows me to put boxes on things. So let's just say you want to integrate with some JavaScript code. This is uh, native for the browser. You know, no extra frameworks required. So there are a couple of ways you could do it, and the the one easiest way is to basically, if you look at the JavaScript at the bottom, you basically write a method, and you attach it to the global window object variable thing. And in this case, it's very simple. The code itself doesn't matter, but rather uh, you quickly attach a uh, a function to the global uh, global window. And then when you want to access that method, it's just as easy. Uh, it's effectively one line of actionable code. But the first thing we have to do is somehow get the IJS runtime. And this is super easy with Blazor. You slap an in inject uh, in front of it and let the machine take care of it. And then when you need to call something, say pop up an alert or uh, perform some JavaScript action, use that JS object that you've got from this machines and you call invoke void async. And that will basically go ahead and tell JavaScript, hey, I want you to execute this particular function. So that's, that's really easy. The hardest part was the JavaScript if you don't know JavaScript. But um, with new JavaScript, as you can see over there, we've got lambdas and the new format. So that is valid JavaScript these days. Back in the old days, it was some weird function and stuff. But now uh, with, with modern JavaScript, it is it is really easy to, to get started. And this is often a requirement for, let's say you're working with a charting library that you love. It's only in JavaScript. And you've got your data that's rendered in HTML. And then the charting library, will, for example, will go and make it look pretty. And you need to talk to that. Well, this is one way. You don't have to always make your own method. Sometimes the methods are injected automatically via the JavaScript library. So you can just sort of don't even worry about JavaScript. You just start calling JavaScript. Uh, it's it's super easy. And now, uh, one thing that I use for Skier Sharp is, you know, I don't want to sort of cloud the global window scope with with lots of functions, right? Skier Sharp has like five or six functions. We're talking back and forth, and you might have a massive app that has several pages and several JavaScript files, and there's no way you can coordinate across the team and say, "Hey guys, this is my name. Don't use it." You know. So what we can do is wrap it in a module. Uh, that's what I call it. I, I was, it was the key word in the thing. I'm not a JavaScript person, so in the case of of my JavaScript at the bottom, I just wrap the entire thing in a class that I export. So this is a JavaScript class, and I can then do almost the same code that I did before, but this time I pull in that JavaScript using, um, I get that JavaScript runtime, but instead of invoking a method, I actually invoke a special import method, and I tell it to import this particular JavaScript uh, file. And then, of course, I can use that as I would normally. 
Um, so that's really cool. And it's isolated in that particular module. So I can import this multiple times in different places, as well as I can have, like, for example, a skier, you might have two canvases on a page. So instead of me writing complex functions to understand which context I'm from, I just import it and say, OK, it's time for you to do something stuff and pass yourself across. So this is really cool, really easy way to sort of isolate chunks of your JavaScript code that you're importing, or if you have to uh, maybe pull in a, a, a module from some other library. Um, but that, that's cool. We're talking about how we can talk to JavaScript. But now the reverse is also very important for uh, for a lot of libraries, especially Skia Sharp. For example, when the canvas has a time to refresh, right? Maybe uh, you've got a, a, a render loop going or the browser has resized the canvas. You need to tell the C Sharp code it's time to redraw. So um, let's just say we've got some function in, in C Sharp. If you look at the top, we've got this random static function. It does some amazing work there, often called reversing text. Um, that's cool. So what we're going to do is we want to call this function from JavaScript. So all we have to do is make sure we've got that JS invocable attribute applied, and that will register it with the sort of like a, think of it as a global dictionary in the sky, and it registers the method name. Or if you look at the comment, I have uh, a way to pass in a custom identifier, right? So I can put in whatever I want there, and that's sort of this global uh, set, uh, Sort of identifier it's not a method in the sense of like c sharp you've got classes and methods this one is just a global identifier that's accessed across the entire assembly and that will automatically do all the bits required so that i can go if you look at the bottom code to say dot net invoke method and i pass in my assembly name and the and that identifier that i want to use that's it it's a magical system that sets itself up so if you add the attribute you can now call it in the um in the, in, the, in, the doc, in the JavaScript code. And because it's async supported, you can call it as an async and use the promises and get a result when it comes back. So I use that um, for, as I said, to, to tell C Sharp it's time to refresh your canvas. Then you get a event in C Sharp that you can start to draw on. So it's very useful. So, but one thing with this is that it has to be a static method, right? Because it's uh, adding it sort of a method in a global cloud out there somewhere in the assembly that uh, JavaScript can talk to. But what happens if you want an instance? For example, I have um, a place for multiple canvases on the screen, right? So I need a way to say, hey, this event is for this canvas. And this is where we can take advantage of another really cool JavaScript feature is uh, taking a look at the .NET object reference. And basically what happens is we have pretty much the same code. But instead of passing uh, in, in, in the JavaScript code I'm talking about, instead of pass, uh, using the .NET object to call a, uh, hey, some way .NET find this method, we are passing in this specific object reference. And how do we get that reference? It's very easy as well. All we have to do is use the .NET object reference class to create this JavaScript reference. Did we lose him? We lost Matthew. It's okay. Uh, I'm sure he'll be back with us shortly. In the meantime, let's just go through some questions. Uh, so uh, first question here is TypeScript and Blazor combination possible? Uh, definitely. Uh, that's uh, Blazor uh, to a large part uh, is built using TypeScript. So it's definitely impossible to do. Uh, I believe we have some docs on the Microsoft Docs website. Uh, if not, uh, feel free to create an issue on the ASP.NET Core repo, and we will consider adding those in. So uh, let's see if there's some other questions that we can go through right now. Uh, so Nicola was asking, is this feature already available? This was introduced in the Add back Matthew. Uh, this was introduced in .NET RC2, as John mentioned. Um, hey, Matthew, we see you. Hey. I, I, there's a, I have a, I'm part of a, 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 the local user group that's, that's having a tech check right now. And what's happening is <laughs> every time they do something, I get switched over to the to the other ten. It's it's, it's just crazy. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know where I was uh, with the show. Where, where did I cut off? I think it was, was it? let me see, was it the one before this? Let me, is that? 
maybe I'll just go faster and see what happens. Because I was talking on my merry way, and it turns out that I was because I could hear everyone else talking, and I couldn't understand why. Like, oh, why are you saying Mac is gone? So uh, it moves me over, but it keeps the audio from this one. It is, it is bananas. <laughs> so okay, was was one. this one? Yeah, was it you, this one. You finished this one, I believe. Okay, so let's move on to the next quick one, and we can get to some C plus plus. All right. Okay, that was exciting for a moment. Uh, okay. So anyway. Uh Sorry, Matthew, before you begin, yes. let, uh, if I can just go through one more question. Uh, so so uh, Nicola is asking here, is this feature a replacement for JS interoperability? Uh, this is uh, actually using JS interop. So uh, when you use .NET object reference and pass it through and forth using invoke void async, that is Blazor's interop, uh, interoperability uh, at work. So just wanted to yes, clarify. Yeah, I'm that literally thing. getting the JS object uh, I don't know if my mouse is showing up, probably not. But basically, I'm actually getting that JS object and I'm using JS interop to, to do this. This is the thing. Okay, cool. Um, okay, yeah. Uh, why don't you take it from there? Oh, cool. And, and, and that is, that's a good question because it reminds me like a lot of people show the demos like this cool little function. The first one, like, oh, we can call some JavaScript. But often you need to do more complex stuff. And like specifically on, on this slide, is sort of, the ultimate complexity is you need to access a .NET object from JavaScript or a specific JavaScript object from .NET. And you need a way to, to sort of wrap it and, and get access to the bits. So in, in order to do that, the, very, the, the first line is I'm creating some random object. This could be whatever you want. In my case of Skiershop, it's basically my little manager to manage the surfaces and stuff. And what I do is I use that .NET object reference.create. And basically, it wraps the .NET object in a special JavaScript thing that I can then pass around to JavaScript. So if you look at the first three lines, I create an object, I wrap it in this .NET object reference, and then I pass that object reference to this process method. I just called it that because I was running out of space. And then when it gets to JavaScript, uh, it's not the object itself, but rather a reference to it that allows me to call methods on it. In the case I'm taking that reference, I'm calling reverse text using uh, invoke method async. Again, note that we don't have assembly anymore. Uh, the assembly name string is because we now have a specific reference to an object. And what will happen is the magic of Blazor will happen. It will take that message and find the reverse text method on the uh, on the actual object. So using all the powers of JS interop, we can now talk both ways and allow us to communicate with JavaScript and .NET uh, in a single process. And with WebAssembly, uh, for Skiershop, you don't even have to use async and things like that, right? So that doesn't work on server client, but you can actually uh, work synchronously as well for all of these methods. But that was more of a side note that I've included as a main point, but let's leave that out for now. So, so far, all we've looked at now is JavaScript, uh, the quick interaction of, hey, I want to call a global method in JavaScript, as well as the, oh, I want to call this random method in C-sharp, as well as looking at, okay, I would like to import a JavaScript module. And now in this last one is how I can talk to a specific uh, C-sharp object from JavaScript. So that was exciting. Let's head over to some curly braces. Now that everyone's got curly braces, I don't know what to call that, C-based language. So... Um, to get started with C++ stuff in, in Blazor is incredibly simple. I mean, you've literally got to tick a box for the WebAssembly build tools, as well as um, tell it, hey, add this property or CS project and say, hey, I want, I want to do some native code. This is the bring in the C++ tool chain, if you will. And then finally, as you would with any JavaScript file, you say, hey, import the native file reference, and this is the library I want to import. You can use a C file directly, or in the case of Skiershop, I have a pre-built binary. This might be what a company will produce. They don't want to distribute all their source code, and you don't want to compile it on every build, but rather just pull in a, a C++ library. So super easy to get started. With. It's basically, this is how you pull in anything into .NET. So C++, an exciting world, or in this case, we're just going to go start with C. For those who have never done C before, it looks very close to C-sharp, and that's why I don't mind using it. It's a very nice um, complicated language, all their pointers and references and weird stuff, but um, C-sharp cleaned that up for me. However, it's, it's quite familiar. For those of you who can see that function in the bottom, it looks like C-sharp function, but it's actually a C function. Uh, it's the same. 
So how do we, let's just say this is a massive complicated uh, function that, you know, couldn't be done in C sharp and we want to use it in C. Well, this is very easy to use. We literally need to take that signature of the method, so the return, the name, and the parameters, and redefine it in C sharp, just the signature. So if you look at the top one, I have int multiply, and it takes in two int parameters. I just literally copy paste it. And then all I have to do is two things. You have to tell .NET that this code, the, the, the body for this method lives somewhere else. And we do that with the extern para uh, parameter or the extern keyword. And then you need to say, hey, where do I find the contents of this method? So if you were to run this now, it would be the compiler error saying, hey, I see it's an extern method. I don't know where to get the body. And that's where the attribute comes in. Say so it's DLR import. It's two main parts that make, make sense to the compiler. Is first off, what is the name of the file that, that this comes from, right? You said it comes from somewhere else, so you gotta tell it where it comes from. And optionally, if you want a custom name, you say an entry point, and that will say, hey, in that file, find this particular method. So that's really easy. It's, it's no magical code required. You literally say, hey, here's a method. It's what it looks like. It's an external method, and this is how you find the bits with that. And when it comes to that, the compiler, as far as the compiler is concerned, that's just the normal random method in your product. And if you look at the first line, you can just call it as is, and the compiler will literally do all the work of loading the .native assembly, finding the method, executing the method, getting the return value, and giving it back to you. It's super easy, and you can get started today, right? But, um, and that's it, right? That's basically the talk for Blazor. You want to do later interrupt, that's it. But I thought, you know what? Since I've got time, I don't know how much time I've got left, probably 15 minutes, let's be complicated, right? Let's spice it up. So I might skip through this pretty fast, but uh, trying to get some C-sharp code, uh, uh, skier sharp code. Matthew, so, uh, sorry, before we move on to the next section, if that's all right, uh, we just have a few more questions and uh, don't, Worry regarding the timing. We still have uh, like a decent amount left, half an hour. We or got so. plenty of time. We got at yeah. least a half hour, and we can go longer than that if we want. So yeah. So uh, before we move on to the next section, uh, we had a bunch of questions in the chat, so we just wanted to address those. Um, okay, where was I? Um, Okay, so as uh, Al is pointing out here, uh, Skirsh, uh, and as Matthew was just saying as well, Skirsharp is just an example in this case. Uh, uh, the purpose of this talk is both to showcase Skirsharp as well as to showcase the native interop capabilities within Blazor. So um, uh, with Blazor or with these native interop capabilities, you can uh, talk to any native library as long as it's compiled uh, using Wasm, uh, using the LLVM, and all that kind of stuff. Uh, Matthew, did you want to add anything to that? No, that's pretty much it. Skiershop is literally just the C binary compiled to Wasm. Cool. Um, so, um, there are some Skiershop specific questions that we can also get into. So, Andy Walter is asking here, uh, what advantage is there to using Skiershop versus SVG? Because SVG is a great graphics library as well. Yeah, so uh, I suppose the main difference between Skiershop and SVG, Skiershop is basically a library that allows you to call commands. Maybe I should hurry up and get to the Skiershop bits. Uh, I thought people were interested in the, in the inner workings. Looks like it's just more me. But uh, Skiershop is basically, you get a, a blank canvas and you execute drawing commands, right? You can say, I want to translate. I want to do, you know, fill with green or something. Whereas SVG is more of a, think of it as a, it's a file structure. So in the case of, let's say you want to do some cool animations, you can do it with SVG using CSS animations or something like that. However, you may also just want to write commands to, to draw it and maybe you do some maths in there maybe you've got like track in the mouse cursor all the stuff that you might be able to do with C, uh, svg but it's definitely easier to do it in skier sharp and svg is i would say it's more of a you create the image and you render it whereas this one uh will be more dynamic and you can write some code with skier sharp it's, it's just a graph it's like system drawing versus uh i don't know png maybe is, is, a, is a reference. It's one's a library and the other one's more of a file format. Mm -hmm. Okay, makes sense. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, people in the chat are loving the, uh, just uh, getting that un uh, in-depth understanding of how Blazor is working along the scene. So you're definitely not the only one there, don't worry. Uh, okay, uh, 
let's move on to another question here. Uh, Leno is asking, um, during build, what will happen to the C Sharp, C++, JavaScript? Uh, is it all combined into a single DLL, or is it perhaps broken down into multiple files and that kind of stuff? Um, so it, 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 well, it, it changes for you under the hood. So let's just say I have a native binary like Skia Sharp. I have some JavaScript files for interrupt, and I have my managed DLLs. What happens during compile time, uh, it doesn't do anything with JavaScript. It puts it, just moves it to the new place, so that's untouched. Your managed DLLs are the same. But what happens with all the native bits, it actually gets compiled into .NET itself. So I don't know if you checked WebAssembly, there'll be this .NET.WASM file. So what actually happens is it takes all the native bits, the C++, the archives, the files, whatever it is, and it's basically it thinks of it as merging it with that. So um, and that .NET.WASM you get now has, for example, Skia Sharp in that DLL. So you, you, you don't bring down the native dependency of Skia Sharp. You basically bring down .NET, which has uh, Skia Sharp now built into it. And then, of course, the same normal with the DLL and JavaScript all separate still. So you've got three changes from I've got a native DLL, uh, a managed DLL, and JavaScript. And when he reaches the client, you now have a .NET DLL or .NET binary, and then the managed DLL and the JavaScript. So mm -hmm. that was a roundabout way of saying no. <sighs> okay, makes sense. Thank you. Uh, okay, I was just going through the questions. We have a lot of activity in the chat. Um, if I missed any questions, please uh, just uh, leave them in the chat again. Um, it should help with uh, searchability and stuff like that. So uh, for now, let's move on to the next session, if that's all right. Okay, yeah, so that. All right. So. A quick intro into including a C method. Uh, the reason uh, I saw a question in there saying, "Hey, C plus plus spit from C uh, thirty years ago. Why do people refer to C and C plus um, plus?" The main the main reason is that C sharp actually interrupts more with C and and C stuff. So we can compile C to make it look uh, C plus plus to make it look like C. And I'll show you a, a snippet in my demo. But basically, with C sharp, C plus plus, it has a whole bunch of. of if let me just go to the next slide. We'll show you exactly what I mean. So with C plus plus, you it will take a class, and that's nice. But the compiler does a whole bunch of name mangling. So my class is going to be like underscore underscore Z seven D underscore my class, and, and it's really hard to find. And sometimes different compilers use different things, right? So what usually happens is you wrap the C plus plus stuff. And you wrap it in a, a a C definition. In the case of the extern C, basically, uh, I would use a C compiler to compile the second bit to say, hey, hey, right. So, so there is a bit of a difference that that makes sense. So, let's just say we got some C plus plus class that we want to wrap or, or, or access in C sharp. It's we can't do it directly. We can technically with certain tooling, and often it's generated tooling, so it will. Go and inspect the stuff, but we don't want to care about that because, you know, like with Skia Sharp, there's like a billion things to bind and it would just be absolutely overkill, right? So I only care about a subset. So what I do is I create, if you look at the bottom, these sort of one liner uh, C methods, right? They don't have access to classes. So I just wrap it, right? So this is the implementation details, not super relevant. You know, if you want to do this, this is sort of how one way you would do it. But basically, I've got a C++ class, and I effectively flatten it into a bunch of static methods. So if you look at the new, all I do is I, I create a new a new class inside the function at the bottom, and I just return it as void star or, I don't know, void a pointer. And when I want to use it, for example, the bottom line will be like get the value. I pass that same pointer back in, and I cast it back and get it like that. Right? So I've taken a C sharp, uh, C++ class, and I flatten it into a C method. So, so that 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 that's what I've done here. So, now that we've got that C++ code written as a bunch of C methods, the same code that we just saw on the previous slide applies again. Look at that! Voila! Right? You can now access C++ bits in the same method by using a static extern methods and then using a DLR import. So, so that's it. It's like boom, revelation. As long as you get it down to that sort of static C type function, then you can do whatever you want. So how do we use it? If you look at the code at the top, it's pretty simple, right? I call a method, I call a method, and I call a method. And um, I let the runtime handle all the hard work for me. 
So I want a new class. I call the I call the function that creates a new class under the hood. I get some random n int, which is the new type, which is added in .NET. Uh, that just represents sort of an integer pointer. It doesn't matter what it is. You don't care about that because when you call, for example, get value, you just pass that same object uh, in, and we let the runtime figure it out, and it will just magically work. So here we have a bit of code to get C++ running in WebAssembly. But obviously, we don't want to use those horrible functions, all those underscores. I don't know. People might do camel case. So what we can do is literally wrap it in a C-sharp class. So that's all I've done. I've taken those methods. I wrapped it into a bunch of C-sharp methods. And then you access it like at the top, like you would any other C-sharp uh, library. And that is effectively how Sharp is built. So it's literally taking a C++ library, I wrap it in the, the wrap the bits I want in C uh, in a C sort of definition, and I sometimes leave out parameters that have no relevance in a managed world, and sometimes I have to add parameters to sort of hold state that represents C sharp objects. So the C API is my def definition, and then I have a tool that basically generates all the these externs and stuff for me, right. and then I just I just use it and consume it like I would. And that's the fundamentals. And are there any other questions? Oops, not that, not that browser. Yes, so we have some questions in the chat. Let me just pull some stuff up. Um, so with regards to performance, uh, someone's asking, um, how expensive is this in terms of performance? This looks extremely low performance for a drawing library. Um, well, it's incredibly fast <laughs> because especially with AOT, this gets compiled effectively into like instructions to call the native code. So there's no overhead in the sense of JavaScript to serialize and find methods and call methods in JavaScript is literally, this is, this is for me one of C sharps and .NET's effectively greatest feature. It allows you to like almost not not zero but almost zero overhead to call a native library because i think the thing we need to remember is even though we've got managed code what's actually running is the mono or the or the dotnet runtime and that is a c++ library so when we call this method the runtime itself can effectively talk directly to um to the native code so like I'm going to show you a, a picture a, not a picture a little demo later of 60 frames a second running in the browser and it's got gradients and shadings and blurring. And as far as I can tell, there is a, a framework out there called Avalonia, and that's allow you. That has an option for you to render the entire UI on Skier Sharp. And they're getting. They're not even using GPU accelerated in some cases. They just run the full thing in memory, and we're getting amazing performance. So, if there is any performance issues, it's not with the PN rate because those team at at the .NET and the runtime they are are wizards. You know, so yeah. Yeah. so uh, would it be fair to say it is high performance because um, because of the native interrupt capability, because it's running on, say, a lower level um, uh, with directly with the native bits and so on? Y yes, yes. Like, definitely we can see a less or worse performance with, like, JavaScript. That's why sometimes we can't do things like this. But also with the Android, like we do JNI for those who've done Android apps, uh, Xamarin Android or, or Maui Android or whatever. Uh, even native Android, it has to go through the JNI and that's using strings and all sorts of things. And that's why Java is slower. That's why the Java apps, besides Java being slightly slower, but Java apps are, uh, uh, the, the Xamarin Android apps are like, have worse performance than the iOS apps because the Java apps have this intermediate sort of JNI layer, whereas the iOS is, is literally calling C functions. That's it. It just calls C functions. So it's it's definitely better. Okay, makes sense. Thank you. Uh, we will get to some more questions later, but for now, do you want to take it from there? All right. Now on to some exciting bit code. So I know I, I rushed through the binding with the JavaScript and the C and C++ stuff. You know, uh, I didn't want to spend all the time on that, and it's definitely more than just what I showed. So uh, it's quite complicated. It, not complicated, more. It's just more stuff to know. Uh, but let's have a look at some skier sharp code. And I think this is what the other half of the people hopefully have come to join and, and, and want to learn about. So 
Skier sharp. What is skier sharp? But before we do that, we need to talk about something else. Skier. Skier sharp, as you can tell, it's uh, the sharp or the net or the N was added, you know, on top of something. That's how we name things in the .NET ecosystem. We take someone else's code, we slap a, a sharp word on the end, and then it becomes, yay, it's a feature. <laughs> so uh, skier is really the main engine of skier sharp, right? Skier sharp is more of a wrapper around skier skier is for me a, one of the most amazing libraries out there when it comes to to drawing and just i like the api so whatever <laughs> uh, it is it is one of the greatest uh cross-platform personally the greatest uh cross-platform graphics engines uh it powers so many things that you use today it supports so many things such as software rendering for bitmaps or rendering to pdf right that's not even a uh, and it's on a bitmap format that renders to documents like okay and then there's hardware rendering using like platform things such as OpenGL or DirectX or Vulkan if you're onto that or Metal for for things it's like okay we're talking on the GPU now and it's written in in really low language there's bits and pieces that are written in assembly because you know C++ was just too slow <laughs> so uh, it, it's crazy there and uh it, it's it's if you look at the bits in um, in like your Chromium or Chrome or Chrome OS or Android and Firefox is also using WebKit so that as well. The stuff you see on the screen is 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 rendered by Skia because you know why why use anything less than the the greatest graphics engine out there? And uh, this is all uh, written and maintained by Google. This is their library and uh, they use it for for a lot of their stuff. There's also the the, I think it's been used for like Flutter and few few. Oh, I think we lost him again. Technical difficulties. <laughs> um, okay, so let's jump to some questions in the meantime. Uh, yep. Just switch views. There cool. was one question about AOT build size. <clears throat> Mm. Um, oops, oh. I think we both clicked on it at the same time. <laughs> I'll try it again. Yeah. So my understanding from the docs is usually IoT build size is bigger. So it's going to produce a, a larger binary, and then it's a trade-off. It'll perform faster, but it's a slower download. Exactly. So uh, one of the use cases that I believe we may have discussed last time is, uh, say you're in a corporate environment where you're working on an intranet. Uh, download times usually aren't that big of a concern because you may have a server in the building or something like that where you can stream data directly from. So in those cases, you can trade off the larger uh, actual binary sizes for being able to have a faster compute of that actual application. So that's one potential use case. There's, of course, many, many more. But that's the one that comes to mind first. OK, uh, I think we have Matthew back. Yeah. How are you enjoying the, the technical one. difficulties today? Oh, <laughs> no. It's like I, I, I just spontaneously am now in another session. <laughs> OK, <laughs> so anyway. Uh, <laughs> OK, so, so um, where were we? We were talking about Skia Sharp, I'm assuming. Yeah, I need to share my screen again because uh, it's an amazing existence. I don't know. I, I don't know. I probably have to report some issue. Don't ever join two StreamYard uh, things happening simultaneously because you'll uh, end up in a random one. All right. So I, I think we, I, where did I get to? Anyone? Anyone have any things? I'm not quite sure. I think you're right up to about here. I don't think we covered this yet. Okay, yeah. so oops, let's go to that one. Let's go to so I was talking about Skia and bragging about how amazing it is. Yeah, did we, we did that? this one. Yes. Oh, yeah. Okay, cool. Okay, so it's, that's that's the Google bit. So Skia Sharp. Um, I'm just gonna summarize it so we can get on with it. But uh, it basically it's a effectively what I just just showed you now with the you know the C plus plus binding and calling the P invokes. That's that's really what it does, and it also has the advantage of being able to be a separate layer that allows me to convert from you know C++ isms to C# -sharp isms right so in the one example would be like we've got i enumerable in C# -sharp and we don't have that in C++ we've got iterators and other weird types so uh, I've, I've taken the liberty to to make it more user friendly um, and stuff like that so 
you know, we got the garbage collector. So a lot of the things you have to worry about cleaning things up and how do we access things? Obviously, I can take advantage of, of, of C++ and, and .NET features to make the life even better. So, yeah. So th that's basically what it is. Gearshop is a wrapper. When I talk about uh, people say like, oh, Matthew, you've got an amazing library. I've seen those tweets. Thank you very much. But actually, now I have to give the credit. These are done by, as I said, the wizards at Google on this library. I don't know how many people work on it, but as far as I know, they're geniuses. I mean, we're talking like, I think it's one of the fastest graphics libraries out there, and it supports all the platforms, and it's fast on all the platforms, and you know it's it's amazing. So all the work is done by them. I wrap it, and as I was mentioned, it runs on almost all platforms. So I have done a bit of work, for example, to get it to run on UWP. Minimal, minimal work. Uh, obviously, they got Blazor uh, WebAssembly support. So I got a bit of work to get it going on Blazor, you know, those sort of things. But they've done an amazing job there. And of course, one addition we do have is a collection of hardware and software views. So in the case of a Blazor thing, you would slap on a canvas view, and then you don't have to worry about anything. It just magically sets it all up for you. And effectively, oh, you want a CPU one? Use this view. If you want a GPU back view, use that. And it, it's pretty cool. It's all written in C Sharp. It's maintained by Microsoft and uh, and also me on my side. It's my side project as well. So uh, I don't know if that may, means anything to you. It's, ba it's backed by Microsoft and it's backed by me. I love it and I'm going to keep working on it. Even if Microsoft decides, hey, we no longer need a graphics library, I'll be like, I, I still think it's one of the most amazing libraries out there. So it's my personal project as well. So let's, let's take a step back from from Skia, and let's get into some more technical aspects of it. So Skia Sharp, one of the reasons I like Skia Sharp or Skia is that it's, it's sort of broken up into, into two sort of layers, right? So we, let's say you want to draw on um, the screen, right? The screen, we've got a view there, and the operating system has allocated bits into memory, right? A block of memory. So the way it breaks down to is you say, OK, uh, you wouldn't have to do this mostly in your code. This is just sort of how it works. But you would say, OK, I want to create a surface that wraps the underlying surface, right? So in the case of a, a view, you'll wrap the memory block that the operating system has allocated. In the case of, oh, I want to render on the GPU, and you bring in some sort of GPU view, like an OpenGL view on iOS, uh, you basically say, OK, operating system, give me your texture, right? You give It gives you the texture ID, and then the skier shop wraps that. Uh, the, the surface wraps that. So it doesn't matter what's happening, you get this one uniform surface, SK surface, that sort of represents whatever the operating system's doing. Then from that surface, you get the canvas. And this canvas is the bit that you interact with as a developer. It's basically where you say, OK, I want to draw a rectangle, draw an image. And it's responsible from taking your request of draw something or translate something and converting it into whatever the surface needs. So I want to draw a line. It might start doing some weird vector stuff in GPU space. And then it takes that, and then it gives it to the surface and say, hey, this is what you need to run in order to get the picture. And then the surface will then interact with the native stuff and, and do what it needs to do in order to, um, to get that on the screen. And sort of that's really all that's required to draw something. But there is this additional SK Paint object that's very important because that defines how something will look. For example, I want to draw a rectangle. OK, I can do that. Now tell me what you want it to look like. And that's where the paint comes in. It would be like, it's just it's literally just a blob of properties that allows you to say, OK, this is the color. This is anti-aliasing or not. Hey, I want to do a gradient. Here's the shader to use. Oh, I want to just do, a, a, I don't know, some sort of mask version of it. So all those properties are set on the paint. So you, as a developer, work with, with the canvas. You call a bunch of commands. That's basically how it works. You've got a, a basically like, I don't know how many methods on there. Let's just call it 100. 100 different drawing commands. And you give it instructions, for example, a rectangle. Give it the coordinates. It will draw that with the paint object you provide, saying, OK, uh, how do I do it? And this, this translates to the, the real world physics as well. If I want to draw on, on a, um, let's say draw a face or a circle on a canvas, like a, on an easel, you've got a canvas to draw on. You're doing a drawing rec, that's your arm operation, and you have to dip that brush in a paint. And the paint has color, uh, maybe it's got a bit of sand in there for texture, all that as well. So it's really cool that it translates into to real world stuff. So 
skip to that. And here is here is an example of, uh, of of drawing in Skiershark. So it's you won't always have to do all of this, but basically, let's just say you on a server, there is no UI. You on a console app, this is the code that you can run to draw a red square. So the first thing you do, as I said, you create a surface. In this case, we're just spontaneously spawning one out of nothing. That's valid. And then, of course, you get the canvas. You clear the canvas like you would in the real world. And then you create a paint object. You grab that red paint, and you draw a rectangle. And this is how you build anything in, in Skia. You can change that draw rect to any type of thing, draw a path, draw an image, draw something, and then you use the paint object to say, OK, I want to be red. Oh, no, I want a gradient. Oh, no, I want this image. So really, really exciting stuff. So I can show a demo, but I don't know if there's questions on that. Let me switch over to that tab. I don't know if there's any questions before I jump into some actual code and how much time we got left. Try We've got and, plenty yeah. of time. People are definitely, yeah, I think some questions, but people are looking for examples, and I think you'll probably answer a good amount when you show some examples, too. Okay, okay. Uh, let's uh, hit this question really quick. Uh, so you can pass the canvas directly into Skia, uh, or are all the draw calls going through the WASM layer? Um, I'm not sure I particularly understand that, but I think what you're asking is, uh, so, so this all this code is running in wasm already right so there's no wasm layer if you mean like the c plus plus layer uh well or, no, i suppose if you take it out of wasm it's, it's really that you don't pass anything to skier you rather tell skier where to find it so skier is the native one looking there so let's say i want to draw uh on on a, a blazer view right a canvas what actually happens is i i allocate memory for uh, for for blazer and say, hey, here's, this is where the, the memory block lives. Skia draws to that. And then I tell Blazor, or I tell JavaScript, hey, this is the pointer to where the data lives. It then goes to that place, reads the memory, and draws it to the canvas for you. So there's no copying of bits, like, oh, move the bits from here to here. It's more of, yeah, the, the memory, like same with the GPU texture, right? I create a GPU texture with WebGL, and I say, this is texture one, whatever, whatever the number is. And I give that to Skia. Skia draws to that, and the GPU, you know, renders it on the screen because it's you drawing to a texture that's visible on the screen, that sort of thing. So, I don't know. Okay, uh, thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think that answers the question. Uh, and we've had a few questions like this. Uh, could we just get clarification on if this is two D or three D drawing? This is this is two D drawing. Uh, probably should have added the word 2D. Yeah, but that's not a. It it draws 2D on a 3D world. For example, OpenGL. So you 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 can draw a three-dimensional square using rectangles, you know, and you scale them and stretch them to make it look 3D. But it is basically a 2D image. But it's, it's not, OpenGL is not just 3D. No, DirectX is not just 3D. It allows you to draw 2D. So that's the advantage we're taking. Cool. Um, okay, uh, I believe someone was asking, let me see if I can find it, uh, one second, okay, uh, yeah, so uh, someone was asking, uh, who was it that did the train game in Blazor with this? I believe that was David, uh, mm -hmm. I don't want to say the last name because... Uh, Weiniger or something? Uh, Wenger, yes, yeah. I believe, uh, so... Of, I'll leave a link in the chat for those curious. It's uh, using .NET uh, and Skia Sharp and all that wonderful stuff. Uh, so it's a great example for people to check out as well. Um, did we lose Matthew there? Either he's just really, really no, still or... Another thing. Here, I have the stream. There we go. Kick out old Matthew. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I'm going to have to... <laughs> I'm in two worlds. All right. <laughs> okay. So let's. Uh, okay. Cool. So let me let me pop up the code screen. Uh, I'm gonna skip over the JavaScript interrupt because that's that's uncool. We've done that before. Uh, the what's what's on the slides is pretty much. If you want to see it, I've got all the code uh, on my GitHub repo. You can check out each sort of level. But let's let's live in. Uh, let's open. Let's open the C plus plus library. Uh, it's huge. Ah, for those watching on the toilet with your phone, I hope this is big enough. Uh, I do a lot of my watching there. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, okay, so just a quick example of a, you know, let's just quick, quick example of this and we can jump into some skills. So as I mentioned that um, I have a C++ library and I got this cool C++ C API. I don't know. I'm not a native developer. I just do what needs to be done. But basically, I've created a C, uh, the C wrapper around it. And as I mentioned in the slides, it's, it's pretty simple. It just literally casts back and forth between the C++ stuff and cause functions on it, right? Uh, this is something that you might write, but if you're bringing in an existing library, you wouldn't write the C++ class and the massive crazy implementation with pointers and stuff. You wouldn't do that. That would be like, for example, you're bringing in a game engine. I don't know. And that would be the library providing it. We compile it down to this native binary that's incredibly small on the screen, but it doesn't matter. It's just called library. And then we go over to for example, here's my C++ usage of it, right? So as I said, I've created this class. I've got the bunch of imports. I've used the properties. And as you can see, I just use it like normal. Create an instance, call properties on it. So it's really cool. And this is the basis of Skiershop, taking advantage of that amazing performance of um, of the, the C++ interop that we got, the uh, stuff. So let's have a look at some Skier stuff. Let's run this. Let's run this. Let's see where it's going to pop up. I don't know which browser it's going to use. I'll probably find this little drop down that will tell me exactly which one to use. But hey, you know, sometimes we live on the edge. Um, no, it's loading. It's coming. There we go. All right. Let's pop that over there. Let's minimize that. Let's try some hot reload magic. All right. Let's, let's minimize that. We don't care about this. Open this one for later. And... Let's have a look. So I created this little mini mini site that allows us to do some stuff. But over here, let's zoom in over here a bit. There we go. Can we zoom in one more? No. There we go. Get rid of that menu. Look at that. So I have a, a little canvas here. It does something exciting. It has text on screen, mostly because I'm trying to keep it as simple as possible. And when you click with a mouse, we high performance. All right. So. Let's move this just a bit. We don't care so much about that. So that that's exciting. So the, the way Skiershop on Blazor works is pretty simple. Uh, it uses a normal HTML canvas. And as you can see over here, we have uh, I, I've created a, a canvas view, which allows you to use normal uh, methods that you would in HTML. But there are some special ones. For example, um, on paint surface, and this is more picture spelling. I'll speak about it in a second. But th that's it, right? So you could take any, like this, which is a normal HTML canvas that you can use with any HTML elements, uh, whether it be like, you know, oh, I've got some library out there that does stuff, you know, resizing or whatever. And this paint method is literally where the entry point is for all your drawing code. So it comes in here. And as you can see, pretty, pretty straightforward. Let me hide those white space markers because I'm obsessed with keeping the tabs and spaces in order. But uh, I get the canvas. And I don't care about the surface because that's created by the operating system, it's created by the browser, it's created by the library, it doesn't matter. And this is where I start doing stuff. So, for example, I've got a paint object and I define, hey, I want black, I want smooth, I want to fill in the text, I want to center my text, and this is the text size, right? I've defined what I want my text to look like. Then I decide, you, okay, where do I want to draw the text? You, um, can you debug into that? Like, can you set breakpoints and debug into that yes, stuff? Yes. yes, let's show off some stuff. So, uh, well, let's debug into that. No. Nope. Well, I was just wondering if it's possible. I didn't. Yes. You know what I mean? Yes, it is. Okay. I can uh, um, just shut the shelf I was, while that compiles in the background. Um, so, yeah. And then, of course, the final again, I draw the text with the paint object and the position. So it, it's really straightforward. So let's, let's have a slightly more exciting example. I don't know why I started off with some boring. Oh, no. What's happening? What is happening? Can anyone tell me? Oh, dear. Wouldn't believe. Let's look at the console tab. Insert the floor. Okay. Oh, my gosh. I cannot see a word. Yeah, that's, that was not supposed to happen. So <laughs> let me, I think what might have happened is that when I hit build, it, uh, there we go. Yeah, it's because it's starting a new session. Look at that. I'm doing so many things at once. The machine <laughs> just gave up. Let's see. Come on. Yes, look at that. Okay, Whew. <laughs> I didn't break anything. <laughs> so, um, okay. Uh, so yeah, obviously, as you meant. Uh, sorry, uh, just yeah. a 
if I may quickly interject there, uh, uh, one thing that uh, we also need to keep in mind with this kind of stuff is uh, on the same computer, you're also doing this live stream. So mm -hmm. that can uh, impede some of the perf and so on. So just mentioning that. I hope everyone sees that 60 frames a second. Obviously, it's not doing much, but you know, uh, I'll, I'll show you an example of doing lots more and still lots of frames a second. So, um, you know, let's let's stop this, right? We can stick a breakpoint in here, and we can obviously uh, oh, come on. What's happening? I am running this. It has to be running it. I see the frames ticking by. <laughs> okay, I don't know what's going on. But that doesn't matter. <laughs> we will wing it. And let's let's I want to show off some hot reload stuff, which I, which is just as cool. Um, I think something weird was going on there. It was working five minutes ago. But anyway, um, let's just confirm that hot reload's working. Let me make this a bit smaller. It was working. I didn't update as I uh, suggested on Twitter. So test. There we go. Okay. <laughs> Yay, my demo is not going to totally blow up. Okay, so everyone sees this cool clock ticking, but you know, let's let's have a look at some exciting uh, way to do stuff by starting over, right? So before we do that, look, I want to draw a shading again. We on the paint object, we set a shader, we draw the circle. You now we can do some cool rotation. But I thought, you know what? Let's delete all of that. And. Uh, and right now, this is a, a running on a GPL surface, so it's WebGR running in a browser. So pretty cool stuff. Uh, let's let's do that. Okay. So let's just say I want to draw a red rectangle, right? As I mentioned, let's just save it so we can clear that white, and let's clear this actually to I don't know, hot pink. Uh, let's make it not. Let's make it as zero. Okay. You see a little blue. So there's a bit of a padding there. The reason I'm just going to show it off, there is a bit of padding. Let's do. My gray, uh, just to show that hey, there is a, that's CSS padding. Uh, so when I put something at say uh, uh, can canvas dot draw rect, and I want to put that out at, at zero zero width of a hundred width of a hundred, and do a new escape paint, and I'm going to set the color. I don't know red. We love red blocks. That's just the test. That's my escape color is not red, right? So there we go. Right, it's in the corner. Exciting. And that, that's pretty cool. And let's just say, OK, I would like to move this block to the center. I know what you can do. You can go ahead and do math, right? Oh, get width divided by 2 plus half the width. Take away half the width, like, yeah, whatever. You know, that involves maths. And using skier maths is an optional requirement. So you can basically say, OK, I can do canvas.translate before. So think of it as when you do an operation to move something or rotate, you are rotating rather yourself over the canvas. So if I want to move something to the right, you're effectively moving yourself with the brush in your hand to the right, and then you start painting. So we want to translate. Let's just say we're going to move it to um, 100 by 100. That's pretty exciting. I don't know why it's red squiggles there. And as you can see, it immediately popped 100 to 100. So let's let's center it. So we go to E dot uh, uh, surface size, surface size dot width divided to 2, and surface size dot height divided to two. Now that's going to put the center of the, the origin point there. And that's because with Skia Sharp, everything's top left. Again, we could do some advanced maths. But the cool way is to say, hey, let's draw my object around that point. So I can control, let's say, well, this is mostly for centering. If you want something left the line, you wouldn't do this. But I can just go minus 50, right? Minus 50, minus 50. So it will effectively, uh, wait, before I do that, let's do something even more exciting. Let's just do canvas dot draw circle and let's just put it at zero zero and make this 10 and do new escape paint. So what I'm doing now is just going to put a, uh, a little black dot. Uh, is 10 the radius there? Yes. Uh, yes. There we go. So that black dot represents, remove this, where I'm going to draw um, the next shape. So I do that. Okay. Now, if I want to put the red block around it, uh, around the center, I can just do minus 50, minus 50, and that'll put the center of the object I'm drawing in there. So let's just say I want to move the object to, I don't know, a third of the width, right? I don't have to change my drawing much. So that's a cool thing that I enjoy about, you know, using translations to do the work. So let's let's do some animation here, right? Everyone's coming here to see 
the animation. Let's just quickly set that to, uh, let's just abuse one of these things. Let's go with tick index. Let's quickly set that to, to zero. Just hot reload all the things. And then, of course, we're going to do tick index plus plus. So tick index is just something we're going to do, and it's going to tick. So let's rotate this. So let's go over here, and let's just canvas.rotate degrees, and let's stick that in there, right? So it's wrong, technically, because that's going to happen, right? Because we <laughs> are rotating around the center point, uh, that, and then we draw off, right? So it's effectively rotating off 0, 0. So let's move it afterwards. This is just normal, basically, look at that, spinning cubes. Whee! All right. Let's, let's, let's go exciting. Let's, let's do some scaling here, right? So let's do canvas. Let's see if I can remember the uh, little formula that uh, I can get a nice pulsating uh, canvas. So let's just say scale one is, keeps it the same. Let's go scale two, you know, huge thing. But let's do uh, float. I think I have to do that beforehand. But let's just do it to be safe. Dot sign. And <clears throat> I forget what it was. It was tick. Uh, index. Oh my gosh, I memorized it and I forgot it. And I think it is tick index. I divide. Uh, let's do that. What does that do? Wow, that's incredible. So, um, oh my gosh, I forgot the formula. There was a thing. Anyway, that's a hectic. That looks pretty cool. <laughs> I think you're hypnotizing our viewers. <laughs> yeah. Okay, 360. Um, ah, floating points. There we go. Slowly pulsating. It's going to disappear eventually. We can probably plus a uh, 0.5 f, right, for make it so it keeps it nice and big and spinning. Right. So there it is. It's doing a little bit of animation. It's technically shrinking a bit. It's very difficult to see. I can increase the volume by like I don't know, timing it by I don't know two, I think, make it go faster. There we go. So it's pretty exciting stuff, right? All running at high speed and. Uh, yeah, and then let, let, let's just give it a color before I, I get totally distracted. So draw the rec. Let's move this into uh, paint. And, of course, we all come here to see, well, P is equal to that. And we all come here to see rather than having some boring red square. Oops, what happened to my formatting? There it is. You can do shader. Uh, shaders are, are things that are more complicated than solid colors. And with Skia Sharp, you're allowed to – you can even draw a shader like with the shader language, like GLSL. Now, if you want to get crazy, so um, we're not going to show that. That's a bit uh, that's a bit extreme, and I don't know how to write shader language. But let's just say, hey, I want to do uh, let's do a linear gradient, right? Let's just do the linear gradient. Let's not get too exciting on stream here, because then we'll be here all day as Matthew tries to figure out. So we want to do a new let's get points, right? This is going to be the the first point. So let's call it zero zero. And we want to go all the way down, let's say the left hand side of the cube to do new escape point. And we're going to do x is 0, y is 100, because that's the height of our object. And I believe, if you can tell sense, yes, new. Um, oops, I'm missing things. And let's, let's give it colors. I don't know, sk colors uh, dot. Let's just do hot pink. That's, that's always cool. And you know what? Let's let's do something cool. So I can just do zero x. Uh, we want a solid color and um, I don't know uh, green, right? I don't know how any other colors. There we go. That should be green. It should be converting. No, it's fighting me. I think I can fix that. Oh, oh it wasn't fight. Stop fighting me. And then of course we want the blend mode. We want to do that. Uh, let's just let's just do clamp button. Let's see if I did it right. There we go. Look at that. Um, I think. It's off center because I might have no because the sh the shader also works with the translation. There we go. I think that's right. That's fifty. I forget. Anyway, it's it's. I got a green to a hot pink. It's a cool shader. I think it's skew. Who knows what what's? Oh yes, it's skew. Yeah, because you know theoretically. Yeah. Anyway, there we go. We. I am not insane. So <laughs> all that stuff is what you can use to build up far complex images. And it's often the case that you won't sit here writing line by line. You might use a tool. So let's quickly show you something uh, pretty exciting. Um, you're going to have to <laughs> – I'm very bad with um, – I, I get too distracted with my own stuff. So I don't know. I'm probably going way <laughs> outside of my original demo. But, hey, who, who cares? Let's put that zero – how many stars do we want on the star, man? Come on. Uh, 
Oh, how, many how many months? How many months has Blazor been around? Can we just use that? I don't know. <laughs> Thirty-two feels good. So anyway, let's just copy this path data, right? So let's say some designer gives you this advanced path. So you know, yeah, it's just got a star path, and let's. Oops, we need to have that because those new lines are in there. All right, ignore that. Okay. So, so rectangles SVG, are cool. That's an S SVG drawing command there, basically, right? That SVG path. Yes. But it's like yes. Move. So that's, that's that's the thing is, so I can just say, okay, I want a path and I want to do escape path dot, and in this case, I'm using a shortcut, just pause the path and we just do star, Whoa. star path. So so that was just normal SVG if you had any SVG editor. And right now the star is white because I, I Googled that, but this for some, let's say you've got some outline icon, you can totally do that and it's for free, get stuff. So, and let's just say that, hey, you know what? Let's, let's draw it. Let's just, just replace it. I mean, we can always add it back. Draw path, pass in the path, and again, delete all of that. And now, just to be aware, I am going to be drawing the path. Look at that. Let's, let's make it bigger. Uh, bye. Oh, we don't have to. It gets bigger. Look at that. A magical path, all the same stuff, and I can do that. And I can, I don't know. Let's, let's, let's stretch something. Let's scale this not equally and let's scale it by one, right? Look at that. Look at that. <laughs> Look at that thing. Hey? <laughs> Pretty exciting <laughs> stuff, right? So effectively drawing with skier is just all these commands and you, you mix it up and there's anything you want. Like, I don't know, let's get into draw stuff and let's see IntelliSense pops up. You can draw, uh, it's kind of zoom in with the magical feature of Windows. I'm assuming everything's on screen. I can't see yes. now. The whole screen has gone wild. But you can draw bitmaps. There's a nine patch. I, I should have maybe had a cool demo for that. I don't know if anyone really uses that. You could draw ovals, paths, uh, regions, and as you saw, paths, texts, text on path and stuff. And a lot of stuff in drawing code, just like with SVG, is basically built up of simpler operations to, to get things. So it's it's pretty, pretty wacky stuff out there. I mean, uh, let's make this color more... Uh, and the gold, just just to end off with, that's not gold, but okay, it's gold for some people. Uh, <laughs> so so that's pretty that's pretty pretty exciting. So I know this is really simple. So I thought, you know, let's let's show off someone from the community. Well, he he works in Microsoft, but uh, this is not a Microsoft product. Just a FYI, uh, uh, what's this? Is it Wind Gear? Oh, trains. I may have spoiled that earlier. Sorry about that. Yeah. No, it's cool. It's cool. We are still showed on stage. I'm really exciting. Um, there's this one that some of you have may have seen already due to being pre-presented, but well, that's <laughs> fine, right? That's someone's gone out there and said, "Hey, I want to make a game." And uh, I don't know. Let's. It's. I don't know if you, how much you showed. But Could you uh, make that full screen? Oh yes. Yeah. No, why? Code. Code's boring, right? And we can zoom in. Look at that. I don't know. Oh, oh, no, I broke it. Okay, fine. Abuse the system. Let's correct that. This is what happens in a local train system as well. They just go around things because, I don't know. There we go. And, of course, I can slap on a on a train, and let's put a couple of trains in there. Uh, let's also zoom in a bit more. And, oh, something's crashed. I don't know if it's me. Or did I pause it? Or did I put two trains to each other? Yeah, Am you have I an unhandled exception there. I think you still have your. Oh, no. I think you still have animations running in the other tabs too, right? Ah, uh, yes. There you go. Look at that. But, <laughs> I mean, I'm just saying. <laughs> okay, so let's try one more time. Let's just give it there. I want to have to speak to you, David, and uh, say, "Hey, I was on live stream. Yeah, everyone was laughing at me at the crash, um, and let's just take a train on that. Look at that. There we go. Look at that incredibly oh, nice. small. Why are these trains so small? They're I mean, fast, though, aren't they? There you go. Yeah. So, of course, we can zoom in on that cool thing. Let's drag this little map. Look at that exciting thing. So, this is not the greatest thing in like, well, this is going to sell us millions, but uh, a, full, a full thing rendered in, in, in um, WebAssembly. And it's, I think, this, if I go over here and I do diagnostics, it's, I can't move that. But in the corner there, if I zoom, does it, go? oh, it gets bigger. Look at that. Okay. Look at those trains going. We are technically getting 60 frames a second. And that's exciting. How about Flappy Bird? Uh, so I, over the years, I have, um, 
every time I do a conference, I add a little thing to the thing, uh, move closer toward a completed game. Uh, but anyway, so here's when I thought, you know what, let's, let's try use real world things. So I took the Flappy Bird game and said, hey, can I reproduce it using Skiershop? And some of you may recognize this. Uh, <laughs> And there we go. We can tap. This is um, obviously mouse interaction as well. And then look at that. Wee, and the shadings <laughs> and the blues and stuff. Right? It's it's all done. And the fading as well. It's all done with, with Skier Shop. And it's, you know, I, I over-engineered it for the unit tests and everything in this. And I, it took me months to get the game done because I had to get past the unit tests. Is, but, that, uh, done using, is that done using like bitmap sprites then? Or is that done with? Yes, yes. Okay. I, I stole the bitmap stripes out of the game itself, you know? Apologies to all the developers out there who sometimes steal your stuff for tests. But uh, uh, yeah, so this is the official game sprites. I'm probably getting into legal trouble. Uh, yeah, but yeah, well, no, I'm just asking because you were showing previously like the drawing commands, and then but you can build a whole thing uh, just yes. using spriting as well, right? Which is cool. Yes, yes. And that might even be the case where you want to do some stuff, right? Especially if you've got some complicated drawing that uh, doesn't, you know. Things. But also, just as you mentioned, let's say you've got this advanced SVG, uh, SVG dot ski, I believe it's called. Don't mind the terrible news on the, on the background there. The world's gone to pot. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so there's this, this guy, he took um, the SVG that was originally for like Windows system drawing or something, and he said, you know what? It's exposed us to the world. And he has this, we use this for resizer to to render ski uh, SVGs as, as bitmaps. So you basically go ahead uh, and load an SVG uh, yeah, and save as PNG, literally that. So you can also draw to a canvas somewhere, like draw a picture. Uh, picture is is Skier Sharp's representation of a sort of a saved set of drawing commands. So as you saw, what I do of writing all it down in the paint method, and it fires every time. However, you can also write that as a picture, sort of save it, and it will do a little bit of optimization, not always, and then replay that. And that means you can totally avoid the managed layer, but also you can totally avoid the uh, going through the API because it has some optimizations instead of it doesn't have to call this particular virtual method and stuff. So you can be even more performance, right? It saves the raw commands under the hood, right? Mm -hmm. So with the SVG, you load it and you can render it. So let's just say you've got a bunch of SVGs that your graphics designer has given you, you load it, and it's say uh, you've got it in the state of a, uh, the picture is a native skier format. So you can just draw it as you would um, uh, yeah, any, anything. So that, that's that's pretty cool. Uh, yeah, so you could totally bring in that library and, and mix and match. And as I said, you probably won't be sitting in a drawing command drawing rectangles and squares, but rather you'll be pulling in SVGs, you'll be pulling in other bitmaps, and you'll be maybe composing it, and maybe if you draw a UI, you have to do some extra stuff. So I don't know, there's just so much to show. Always don't know what to show off. I mean, it is, yeah. the fact is, you can do anything in, in Skiershop that, that's on the screen. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I just wanted to point out two things about this animation here. Uh, so uh, we discussed earlier the differences between something like Skiershop uh, and SVG. Uh, and uh, here we've seen how we can actually use the SVG within Skiershop. So in a way, could you say that a Skiershop can be kind of, not, strictly by definition, but kind of is a superset of SVG in that it can utilize SVGs within its context. Yes, yes, yeah. You can, and and let's, let's, I can do like, for example, let's just show some crazy stuff here. I can do a canvas dot, can clip, right, clip path. So let's go back to, to, to clip path and let's do path. I don't know how this is gonna go, I didn't quite practice this, but I can go back to draw rect. Um, Okay, so let's say I'm loading some advanced image. Let's call it minus 50. And I want to, uh, I wonder how this is going to go. Looks uh, like you have an exception. I have exception, nice. Let's just run it again and see. So it's going to have to recop up. But anyway, let's assume it worked. What will happen is I can clip what I'm drawing to an SVG image. Like I can use SVG as a metadata to define what I want to do. So let's say you've got some cool drawing and you want to render like some background gradients and something's gone horrible. I don't know what's going on. What's happening? Give me the facts, machine. Don't yeah. fail me now. Oh my God, there's something happening in that loop. Yeah, some people are, are saying like, hey, this is this is laggy or it's not going fast. You've so, shown several times things going at 60 frames per second. And I think yeah. maybe some of it is just like the, um, 
the the rotation like algorithm or whatever that you know uh, I mean? it might be the fact that i'm streaming from africa over to the u.s or wherever this is hosted yes. and then down to you <laughs> that's so. a big thing um so kind of to that uh to that topic uh, is there any easing function for the animation um well that's sort of what i was going with the thing so there's no and i suppose that that's something i need to bring out right so skier sharp is not designed to be uh like oh i want to make some cool game and here is a whole bunch of utility methods and functions and helpers rather it's a raw um like it's a graphics engine right so you might not use skier sharp in your app directly you, you could, right? I know I can't, I don't know if I can say the name, but let's not say it. They use Skiershop on their servers to process millions of, of stickers, let's call it that, a day, right? That draws the text. And they, they don't care about anything. They just got text and blocks to draw, right? And that's useful because you don't need a library to draw a square. But let's say you're trying to do a game, like like the train's done, right? D David has, his name is David, not Daniel. I, I, sorry, Daniel, David, if, if I got this, I think it's David, uh, is that uh, he's made himself a little engine to say, okay, I can draw a train, right? Or I can draw things with a gradient, right? It's, it's helped them, you know, be more productive. So that's where something, maybe um, a library, I think there's a couple of libraries, I can't think of them offhand, that really do this type of thing. They create a bunch of, I think it's like skier shop elements or something that has a whole bunch of useful things for you. So there's no easing function, but, you know, that's because Skiershop, Skier doesn't maintain a whole tool set for you. So, yeah. So, no, it doesn't have it, but there are libraries out there, like with Avalonia drawing the stuff or the SVG rendering, right? Use all the system stuff. It renders to Skiershop, but, uh, yeah. Sure. Uh, that makes sense. Um, and uh, just, I think, to your point earlier, uh, Skiershop can also be run on the server. So, uh, for example, if you want to uh, make a, a line of business application with invoices or receipts or something like that, uh, that you want to uh, create a PDF for, uh, that would also be possible. Yes. Yes. And, yeah, that PDF is a really cool free feature. I don't know. I mean, I think Google just wrote it. They're like, okay, when you do a, a save, whatever, of your your browser just like oh, i just use this yeah, if you, i don't know they use that but yeah it seems a weird thing to add to a um, graphics engine we have a question here uh does kia sharp uh, support vulcan and directx 12. so with vulcan yes it does right now uh there's an, a live because vulcan right now there's no sort of built-in format on any other platforms really uh it's a it's a separate library so if we head over to Let's go to nougat and that electricity crisis some people are having that all around the world uh this is here sharp let's just do vulcan so what oops i vulcan whatever it's going there we go so i'm currently using sharp vk uh it's a really little bit of layer in between i'm more this library just forms a glue between vulcan uh, the sharp vk and i just depend on on sharp vk but uh, so, yes, it supports it, not out the box, but Skia itself does. That's how I can do this. And it, yes, it does for DirectX 12. Right now, I don't have any useful helpers for that because most of the time I get away with, um, with Angle. For those of you who don't know Angle, uh, it's just Google. And another one of Google's amazing geniuses, they decided, hey, everyone should be using OpenGL. And if you want to use Windows, you need to use DirectX. But how about let's make OpenGL DirectX the same thing? So they've done this library, which basically translates your OpenGL calls to DirectX. So that's how currently it works on UWP, because there's no OpenGL on UWP at all. Uh, and the same with, uh, okay, Windows, I'm cheating a bit, I'm using OpenGL. But on uh, uh, UWP, there is no OpenGL. There's no library for it. You can't bring in OpenGL 32. So we're actually using Angle under the hood to to draw directly to DirectX. So, yes, there's a guy out there that did a PR or a thing on using WPF's OpenGL Canvas thing, their whole the whole uh, pipeline, but using Skier. So that's something that I probably need to think about bringing into Skier and saying, hey, on the platforms it's DirectX. But it's a lot of work to set up all that DirectX stuff. And I am <laughs> totally not a graphics developer. But, uh, sorry. One thing I think it was um, Skia Sharp extended. Um, ah, yes. You were mentioning one thing before, that. like a, a, a layer, and they have some pretty cool demos too. This one. Yeah, 
Was that? Did uh, you already show that? We've been showing so many things. Yes. Yeah. This this one uh, is a project I'm trying to work on. Um, I don't know if I've got docs somewhere. I think I've set up a docs. Here we go. Yeah, right. I, I try to, to 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 do what what they ask. Like, okay, like the blur hash. This was a fun one, right? So this string uh, can do that, right? That was a cool thing I saw on the web, and I thought, hey, I can integrate that. I didn't want to integrate into Skiershop because I can't always maintain everything. I'm, I'm sort of leveraging the power of Google to maintain. Here's Confetti View that I was been working on. Get this cool thing, you know, uh, pretty exciting. You know, I, I got it in the code. I, I, it's open source. No, I, I haven't released it. You know, it's like the whole thing. It's like, I, I want to. Oh. <laughs> but yeah, it's just unfortunately um, not always the. Like, I got some image source extensions, like, okay, convert for, for forms to convert in any I image source or whatever. And of course, it's like geometry, like you can see over here, uh, the biggest path in, interpolation. I've got a little algorithm to convert between SVG or any parts, really. It does some magic. I found a library on JavaScript that I sort of loved and ported, and you know, I want. I want you know, no, there's not enough time in the world. Yeah, so definitely, yeah, okay. you might not use Skiershop directly, but if you maybe your library or your team creates a library that makes you productive, or there's a whole bunch of them out there on the on the web that say, hey, use the power of Skiershop to draw anything anywhere, but not have to worry about these individual translate, rotate, drawing cores. However, you might want to, you know. It wasn't super crazy, so no, it's yeah. That's cool. Uh, that, okay, this, that's this awesome. Dream. <laughs> um, well, thank you so much for uh, showing this to us. It was great learning more about how Blazor Native Interop works, as well as all the wonders of Skier Sharp. Uh, and I love the demo as well. Uh, I'm sure everyone uh, else in the chat and streams did as well. Um, I. I think that just about wraps it up for today. Um, uh, just a question for you uh, more generally. So uh, if people want to be contributing to Skiersharp and stuff like that, uh, is there a getting started guide or what would you recommend? Uh, yes. It's, oops. Oh, my gosh. The whole window's gone. So if you head over to github.com slash mono slash Skiersharp and you head over here, it's I got a in the wiki a getting started guide just to help, help people. Most of the time, you know, you can just do, oops, I think it's that the right one. Uh, a little checklist, you know, depending on this, your requirements, you know, it's quite a bit of things, but, um, you know, and then you can download externals and just, just get just started. You can open the solution um, in Visual Studio and start working. One thing you do need to do is get the native bits in place. But then again, I got that one command you can copy from the wiki to execute or download the latest from CI for you. You don't have to worry about it. And then you just open the, in the source project is a, uh, a solution file. You just open it, like Windows or Mac, depending on your platform, you know, just to make less errors. And uh, just you know, there's samples in there. You can even, like what I do personally, is I go to, okay, I want to do stuff for, I don't know, let's do, do stuff for a Blazor, right? I go to the basic one, because it's there, and you just open the solution, and that has links to all the project needs, and you just go in there, you can do hot reload, and type, and, and watch the action. So it's, it's super easy. It's, it's quite a simple library. You know, the, most of the bindings is generated half-ish, and then the other stuff is the view. So, I don't know. I, I'm really the only one working on this. So, if you find some way, like, hey, I don't understand, please open an issue. Please let me know. Uh, I'm on Discord, so. Okay. I'm joining awesome. this one. <laughs> Uh, that is awesome. Thank you so, so much once again for joining us today. Uh, thank you, John, as well. Uh, and thank you to everyone watching. It's been great uh, seeing all the activity in the chat. And I hope you all enjoyed it. So that's basically it for today. Thanks. Bye. Right. Thanks so much. Cheerio.